Thank you. Once, I want to tell you some stories today. Uh, summer is going to be a story-ish time. Uh, but I want to tell you why uh, I'm, I'm doing this. In the fall, what I'm hoping is that we spend the fall season um, talking about the future of St. Mary's, uh, the future of mainline churches, and what we're going to be like, uh, what possibilities and options are. And um, I, I will expect that out of that process, there will be some degree of what I hope and trust will be healthy conflict and disagreement. Um, and so today I want to talk about negativity because there's a difference between negativity and <coughs> honorable people disagreeing with the best of intentions. And so part of the way, part of what we've got to do together um, for the sake of the future of the church and God's kingdom is learn how to have the conversations that sometimes contain difficult questions. Because um, one of the things that will surely mess up the church, I won't say destroy because nothing can destroy the church, but it can sure mess it up, is when well-intentioned people with the best of intentions go in different directions and don't cooperate with each other. And so the first story I want to tell you is a story of a church in which that happened. Uh, it's a story in this diocese. Uh, it's one of our township's churches. It used to be uh, one of the strongest churches, let's say the top five strong churches in the townships so when we had about 40 or 50 churches there. But over the years, it had, it had declined um, to the point where the person who was the rector when this story happened, uh, he happened to be my first curate. And there was really some question as to whether the church was going to exist, going to continue to exist. Um, and, 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 and Charles came to me one day with this story and it was really a really interesting story. There was a group of people in his church, and they were called the Friendly Society. Some of you might recognize this now because I have referred to them before. They were called the Friendly Society. And this was a group of mostly, well, all elderly women who would get together on a regular basis, and they'd have snacks together, and they'd have tea together, um, and, and they, they would get things ready for the bazaar or whatever, whatever else was in the church thing. And they were called the Friendly Society. And Charles would say to me, uh, from his lofty heights, Charles was six, four and three quarters, a man I looked up to. Um, Charles would, would say, they are anything but a friendly society. They are not a group of people that were friendly. See, Charles, having been my first curate, he was used to the ladies' guild from uh, St. Margaret's Mascouche, where if me or, or if Charles came by while they were having a meeting. Uh, the smiles on their faces would light up the room and people would practically come to blows to be the first to get us coffee and a cookie. You know, they were just a spectacularly wonderful group of people. And so all of a sudden he was having a very different experience. And uh, he was actually told that, um, no, you don't have to come to our meetings. You know, it's like, I'm directed as a group in my church. Anyway, it was one of those groups. And so he explored a little about the Friendly Society. And he discovered that the Friendly Society had come into existence during the Second World War. Because during the Second World War, there were a lot of uh, young married women in, in the parish, some with children, some later to have children after the war. Uh, young married people. And there was, in fact, a ladies group in this particular church. And in those days, many more people went to church as community center, not only for religious activities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but it was a very different time. Uh, and so these women wanted to be a part of this group, or at least some of them did. But they felt that this group was very insular, what we would call cliquey, very exclusive, and they just didn't feel welcome or the, that they were, were wanted or belonged. And during the Second World War, one of the things this, this group did was roll bandages, you know, um, and, and, and so they wanted to be a part of this, but they just weren't included. And so what they did was these young women, unlike this group that existed, they got together and became a new group, which they called the Friendly Society, as opposed to the Unfriendly Society. Okay? Um, over the years, 
they had become the very thing that they came into existence to oppose. And that's the difference that negativity makes. The response to what was going on was a negative response. It was a type response as opposed to what's going on here, how do we deal with it? The difference between being negative and critiquing or being critical. Being critical and critical thinking does not necessarily mean negativity, but it can be. So that's one story. I'll tell you another story. This, this, this one, um, a personal one, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, since being rector of St. Mary's and coming back to the West Island from, you know, fields far away, um, I've been, I was regional dean twice, which basically means some administrative responsibility for the parishes in our particular locale. And when I became regional dean the first time, the previous regional dean, who was moving away, brought to me a giant cardboard box. And in that giant cardboard box were check stubs going back to the 50s, uh, minutes of annual meetings from every church in the area, minutes of the monthly clericus meetings, a gathering of clergy, notes from deanery chapter meetings. It was just, it was this, and so I asked a question. What am I supposed to do with this? You know, and you know what his response was? Put it in your basement and pass it on to the next regional dean when you quit. So I did. Never used the stuff. Uh, I tried to raise the question as regional dean at, at our clericus. Like, guys, we've got all this stuff. What's it for? Like, what are we here for? What are we about? Why, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Got absolutely nowhere. So, when I stopped being regional dean, I passed it on to my successor. And he said, what are we supposed to do with this? And in his office, one whole wall, the whole wall was shelves. And I said, you got space there. And so, the box did go on one of his shelves and it stayed there till he passed it on to Dean Brady, who was the next regional dean. And I don't know because I wasn't part of the conversation, but I would suspect that Dean Brady said, what am I supposed to do with this? And he was probably told if he asked the question, which I bet he did because Dean was Dean, pass it on to your successor. You know what Dean did with it? Passed it on to recycling, which I think was a better option. Nobody's ever missed it, that box as far as I know. But it avoided the issue. It avoided asking the questions that needed to be asked. Why are we doing what we're doing and why are we doing it the way we're doing it? Okay? These questions have to be asked. F final set of stories. Um, as you know, quite apart from the MS thing, I am on the downhill slope in terms of my career. Uh, I've been at this uh, 35 plus years, uh, 40 years, they, you know, put you out to pasture unless, um, well, I won't go there. Um, but I, I'm, I'm definitely, like most people of my age, in a summing up phase in terms of what have I done, what have I failed to do, what are the highlights, what are the lowlights, how has it been, what would I do differently? I'm asking all those questions. We all ask those questions when you get to this stage in life, and sometimes even earlier. And um, one of the things I'm doing is reviewing my diocesan involvements. And I was thinking a while ago, recently, but not too long ago, that in the years that I've been a rector, I have been on an evangelism committee, an evangelism unit, and an evangelism task force in the diocese, none of which did anything to do with evangelism no evangelism came out. There were lots of meetings and lots of discussions and lots of paper that's probably sitting in a box somewhere, but no evangelism. And some of you may recall that uh, the, a couple of archbishops of Canterbury ago, George Carey, um, called the 80s, said that the 80s were going to be the decade of evangelism. And after the decade of evangelism, uh, he did a review of the decade of evangelism. And he said, you know what, there's been a lot of speaking of evangelism, there's, a lot of been, there's been a lot of conferences on evangelism, and a lot of people use the word evangelism, 
but there hasn't been a lot of evangelism. And he was accused of being negative. Interesting. His successor, Rowan Williams, came along and said, we're not going to talk about evangelism. That's, no, we're not going to talk about evangelism. We're going to talk about doing church in a new way. Because when you do church in a new way, evangelism happens, or it doesn't happen. But clearly, old structures are not going to cause new things to happen. And so I think of my experience on evangelism, units, task forces, and committees. And on one, when I was actually chairing it, and I was trying to come up with a program for the parishes of the diocese to actually do evangelism, uh, the biggest problem I had was getting people to agree on a definition of evangelism. And afterwards, one of the other people who was on the committee took me aside and said, Lorne, this committee isn't to do it. We're here to talk about it. And I went, oh, well, I won't say what I said uh, to myself. But I was thinking about, well, Jesus didn't come to bring the kingdom. He just came to talk about it. And I sort of wonder sometimes if the church exists more to talk about it than to actually do it. And you know, that can be expressed very negatively in a just search and destroy mission kind of way. But I'm committed to the notion that you have to ask the difficult questions in order to get the appropriate answers for your time. And one of the questions I think we do have to ask is, are we here to talk about it or to be it, to live it, to do it? And there are different clues that we can have as to which side we're on. If things start getting a little yeah, sketchy, and all of a sudden you want to have a lot of committee meetings and generate a lot of paper, chances are you're sliding just... that. I'm not against paper, I'm not against reports when they serve a purpose, but chances are you're sliding into an area that, 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 that you don't want to go in. If you get a bunch of well-intentioned sincere people who want to do good things but won't work together, you got a problem. I'll give you an example of that. Once upon a time here, um, and uh, I'm glad Maria's at the back because her eyebrows would probably be very expressive at this thing. Once upon a time, uh, there was a person who joined this congregation who fancied herself a brilliant musician. Um, in comparison to Marie, uh, and I've got to do this just so that you have a context, I, in my opinion is, uh, her skill set was somewhat more limited than, than, than Marie's. And her expertise, uh, both uh, in playing and in singing, uh, was not of Marie's standard. But she thought she was God's gift to the church. She was an absolute diva. And a person like that will destroy the church no matter how skilled they are. I have always wondered how a church could have an organist or a musician, keyboard player, whatever the church has, who is not a Christian. How can a non-Christian music director lead Kingdom Word? A non-Christian music director, without doubt, with a great deal of expertise, could stir people's hearts and emotions and create wonderful, wonderful music. But we're not here to create wonderful music. That's not what we're here for. We're here to use wonderful music to worship God and to build our spirit. And so it seems to me that before musical expertise, 
faith has to come. And I would much rather have a musician, and this of course is not in any way addressed to Marie, I would much rather have a musician who is kind of poor as a musician, but kind of strong in faith than the other way around. And that's not negative. It's critical because you can't reach your destination unless you've got the right tools to get there. And in order to have the right tools to get there, you've got to ask the right questions. Now, as a church, we are, every time we get together, and even when we don't get together, we're determining the future of the church. Seems to me one of the next things we have to do is write down on paper what are the questions we need to ask. And I guarantee you that if we do this with honesty and integrity, some of those questions will be very difficult indeed. And there will be a tendency when we're made uncomfortable by a question to say, don't be negative, and accuse the person asking that question of being negative. For example, a question we must ask, should we try to continue to exist as an independent congregation? Or should we realize that by combining with another church, our resources, our people resources, will be more freed up than they would be otherwise. Are we doing what we need to do in order to let St. Mary's name be known? Um, when Merlene Boken came to the diocese, I got five minutes. When Merlene Boken came to the diocese a number of years ago, one of the things she said about St. Mary's is, uh, you're one of the best kept secrets in the diocese, but you're a secret because you're in. If you were on a main road, da 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 da. So her idea was, close St. Mary's and a few other churches, combine and make one super church on, on St. John's. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, that won't happen. But the idea of we're in off the beaten path and so nobody's coming here because of that, that's nonsense, that's nonsense. Uh, every week, three or 400 people come to this place for Irish dancing. And I'm not criticizing that, but I'm saying it's not about location. So critical thinking and critical questioning asks the essential, the real questions. It also asks questions of faith. And that becomes personal and also becomes corporate. How do we believe? What do we believe God's will to be? And how are we getting from here to there? Um, this can go on you know, for, for, for a long time. And I, I, I have to quite appropriately call a halt to it. But I'm, I, I just want to put on the agenda today um, that we need to ask questions. We need to ask questions of our future. There are some things that St. Mary's does brilliantly well. There are some things where, without doubt, we're the, the point of the spear. Uh, there are things that we have done and, in fact, are doing that happen nowhere else in the diocese, and we have been brilliantly successful. However, as a congregation, as a parish church, our future is still very, very much in question. Not because we're not nice people or don't have any sense of what church ought to be, but because we're living in a time that necessitates asking some very different questions. So I'm just going to leave that with you.